Phil Polstra, and I would just want to talk a little bit about hacking and forensics on the go. What can you do with uh, battery powered, low power devices? So, what is this talk about anyway? Um, as I said, battery powered, low powered devices, what kind of fun can you have with them? In particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about an ARM based Beagle board, Beagle bone. Uh, system that I've developed over the last year or so, uh, and give you a little insight into how you can port stuff to a new platform, and also talk a little bit about USB forensics. Uh, if you know me, I've been doing a little bit of talking about USB forensics over the last couple years, uh, and now we have high-speed USB, so that's kind of cool. All right, so why should you care? Well. You can take a whole set of tools and fit it in a kid's lunchbox. If you don't believe me, look on the table, all right? Um, so someone asked me, why do you have a Buzz Lightyear lunchbox? Well, number one, it was on sale. And number two, I thought it's kind of appropriate because I'm going to hack you to infinity and beyond with my stuff, all right? Um, so what I've done is I've developed a nice full feature Linux uh, distribution. It's nice to have a full Linux distro because that gives you a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of stuff you can do. You know, there are, there are some drop boxes and little pony plugs and things like that out there. And they're, they're cool and they have their place. Um, but there is a lot of flexibility in having everything on every little device. Um, the other thing that's nice is if you have a low power device, you can run it for days or weeks off of battery, maybe a little solar power, uh, who knows. Uh, it's small stuff, you can plan it and come back later and get it. Um, and did I mention, you can do some high speed USB stuff. So who is this handsome dude anyway? Uh, I teach at a, a small university in Iowa. Uh, Got a few students here today. Uh, I've been programming since age eight and having fun with hardware since about age 12. I've also been known to fly and build airplanes and have some fun in aviation. So what are we gonna talk about? I wanna talk a little bit about uh, platform choice, uh, what kind of OS did I wanna select as a base OS, how do you build out that base OS, how do you add all your good tools? Uh, there's the easy way. When you get lucky, you can leverage some repositories. And then the slightly harder way is when you're starting to build stuff out of source code. Um, talk a little bit about how you can build some different accessories. I have a couple of demos. Um, being how the live demo gods go, I have some demos of screenshots. I know they're not quite as dramatic, but they work. So that's always a good thing. And talk a little bit about some future directions that I have in mind. All right. So choosing a platform, I went about this and I said, I want something that's small, low power, affordable, mature, has built-in networking, has good USB support, and it has convenient input and output options. And the winner turned out to be the Beagle Board. Why the Beagle Board? It's three and a quarter inches square, pretty small, less than 10 watts, okay. about $149 if you just buy one. Uh, it's based on a Cortex A8 processor, comes in with built in networking, has four USB high speed ports, and USB on the go. Lots of output options, DVI-D or HDMI. So if you have a TV, you can use a TV. If you have a digital monitor, you can use that. Uh, it has S-Video, again, you can use that on your TV. Uh, you can output LCD, as I've done here with one of my systems that I've mounted to my Buzz Lightyear lunchbox. Uh, it also has serial connections, webcam connections, micro SD slot, all that good stuff. All right. And here's a picture that I ripped off of Wikipedia uh, about the Beagle Board. 
Basically, the Beagle board is meant to be a desktop replacement. Right? So you can replace a desktop with this. And again, it is not very large. So on the back of this LCD screen, I have a Beagle board, and here's another Beagle board um, that's separate. And they're both running the same full-on pen testing and forensics distro. All right. By the way, some people might say, why didn't you get the Raspberry Pi? Especially people from the UK, they're like, oh, why didn't you use the Pi? Um, the Pi doesn't meet my criteria. It definitely doesn't meet the mature criteria. And um, as I'm about ready to say, using Ubuntu as a base distribution is a good thing to do if you're doing pen testing kinds of stuff. As you probably know, Backtrack is Ubuntu based. So a lot of those tools that are out there are already in some of the Ubuntu repositories. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, not known to run Ubuntu really at all. So um, was not a good choice. Also, try to get the Raspberry Pi in this country. They're still not very available. But, um, so when you buy a BeagleBoard, it comes with Angstrom Linux, which if you've never run a BeagleBoard or a small device before, you've probably never heard of. But uh, that's what comes in the box. It's kind of optimized for the hardware, and that's a plus. Oops. And it has some nice package management, but it doesn't have really good repositories. And for that reason, I chose Ubuntu, because it had good su community support, good repositories, et cetera. So how do you build your base device? How do you get started with this? Uh, well, the first thing you probably want to do is when you bought your Beagle board, it came with a two or four gigabyte uh, micro SD card that had, uh, that had not Ubuntu, had uh, Angstrom in it. You want to upgrade that. So how big do you want to go? Well, go big or go home, right? You know, 16 gig or 32 gig if you're cheap. Uh, I know there's no cheap people in West Michigan, right? Definitely not. Um, if you're cheap, you could go with an eight gigabyte. Uh, that would only give you about two gigs free. Uh, and then how do you go about building this? Well, you can download an image, and you can go to Canonical's website, and they do have an Ubuntu for ARM image that you can get. Uh, Mr. Nelson, Robert C. Nelson, also has some demo images. I chose his images. Why? Well, because he's tweaked his stuff for the Beagle board. Right? The canonical folks, you know, their stuff runs, but uh, Robert's stuff runs better. He updates it very frequently. Uh, there's also some good instructions on how to do this yourself at eLinux or BeagleBoard Ubuntu. All right, so if you follow that link, you can get there. All right. The easy part. What's the easiest thing you can do? Apt, get, hey, it's there. This was easy, right? So you get lucky on a lot of the tools. You know, I pretty much looked at Backtrack and I said, okay, which of these tools does anyone really use and which of them do I find useful? And if I thought it was useful, I ported it, right? Uh, in many cases, it was as simple as doing an app get, in some cases, downloading some deb files, possibly tweaking them a little bit, uh, and they worked. So what works best? Well, if you have something that's written in a nice interpreted language like Java, Python, Perl, Ruby, et cetera, um, usually it kind of worked out of the box. I didn't have to do a lot of work. Uh, C-based tools, you know, if you had the right libraries installed, most of the time it worked, you know, probably 30% of the time you had to do a little work, right? So what about the harder part? What if you don't have something in a repository, you don't have a nice dev file? Well, if you gotta build it from source code, you gotta make a choice, right? And you have two basic choices. You can either build it on the Beagle board, or you can cross-compile it. Now, why would you want to build it on the device? It's easy. Why don't you want to build it on the device? Well, you know, it's a nice desktop replacement, but 
you know, it's not like a build server, all right? It's a little, small, low power device. You got a gigahertz processor and you've got half a gig of RAM. So it can take a little bit of time to compile something huge. Um, enter cross-compiling, right? So what do you do when you cross-compile? You cross-compile, you take your quad-core, hex-core, oct-core, whatever you have desktop with boatloads of RAM, and then you use that and use all that power to compile stuff, and then you just move it later. All right, so that's the, the big advantage. Well, of course, there's a downside. It's a little bit more complicated, a little more involved. All right. So what if you want to do the easy thing? Uh, pretty much all you got to do is install build essential, build dash essential, and you're on your way. By the way, it's build essential, not build essentials. Um, I would have thought it's essentials. It's more than one thing, but uh, I didn't name the repository. I didn't name the package. So. Um, something else to keep in mind, if you are shelling in to these little devices, if you're looking at the Beagle board, uh, the Beagle bone is different, but the Beagle board, the Ethernet is done through the same chip that does the USB. And an artifact of that is every time you boot the thing, if you're using DHCP, it says, hey, you're somebody new, because it gets a new MAC address. And they can be kind of obnoxious if you keep getting a different IP address every time you boot it. So just something you should be aware of if you're going to work with these devices. All right, so how do I cross compile? Well, there's a couple of options. The absolutely simplest option is you go, you download a tool chain, right? you untar it, you set up your build environment. There's usually a script in there. And by the way, you can get these slides. I'm going to kind of give you an overview, so don't worry that there's a lot of detail in here. Um, you know, you can ask me about, about it later. Um, download your source code, and you do the slightly modified version of the standard configure, make, make install cycle. And the only real change is when you do your configure, you have to add this option where you tell it, hey, I'm not building for this computer, I'm building for something else. What's that something else? It's probably ARM, Angstrom, Linux, GNU, E, B, and you might have to prefix uh, your stuff if you're building in a subdirectory. Uh, you don't have to do that if you've installed this stuff for every user. So once you've done that, make and sudo make install, uh, will create your stuff. Now you got to copy your binaries over. How are you going to do that? Um, you can use scopy, you can use thumb drive, whatever you want to use. You could use USB networking if you really wanted to. Um, one small problem you may run into, if you're compiling and you might have a package that's designed for a particular kernel version, and if there's a mismatch between that kernel version and the kernel version on your Beagle board, you could have some problems. I haven't really run into this problem much, but it's just something you should be aware of. Right. So how do you do it a little bit more fancy way? All right. um, well, you can install the tool chain, as I described, and then you install Eclipse if you don't already have it. Within Eclipse, you have to install the C, C++ dev tools download your software, and use your make file to create an Eclipse project. Now, you can, there is an option in Eclipse where you can say, hey, I want a make file based project. That's probably not what you want. Here's why. For one thing, you're going to have to tweak that make file anyway. Because that make file assumes native compilation, not someone that's cross compiling. Right? So, you're already going to have to modify that make file. Personally, what I prefer to do is I look at the make file, see the dependencies are, and I create a new project in Eclipse. You can do what you want. But, um, and once you've done that, you create a build configuration. You have to tell it, hey, this is not for my, me. This is for this other platform over here. Compile it, and then you move over your binaries. Simple enough. 
Um, again, you can create the project either using the make file based project, which I tend to not prefer, or you can create your own. Uh, you create a build configuration, you go into the Project Explorer, you tell it build co configurations manage, you create a new one, you set up your pass. Uh, basically, instead of GCC, it'll be GCC dash arm blah, 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 blah. All right? And that's going to vary depending on which tool chain you install. A really good tutorial on this. Uh, Jan Axelson, she's written a lot of books, especially about USB stuff. Uh, she also has on her website LVR, which is Lakeview Research. Uh, she's up in Madison. Uh, on her website, she has a really good tutorial on how to do this stuff. So, you know, if you hear me talk, you get my slides and you're still confused, well, you can email me or you can go to her website and maybe she'll do better deal of uh, explaining this to you. All right. Uh, method three, the Cadillac method, right? It's the same as method two, except you take it to the next level and you can easily move your binaries over. You can use Eclipse to do all this stuff for you, right? And that's the biggest plus. You can also remote debug it. Like if you're having issues with a package that you've ported over and you're thinking, ah, Wonder what's going on. Well, you could fire up the GDB debugger natively on the Beagle board, or you could fi fire it up remotely and use your more powerful desktop. So how do you do that? Um, in Eclipse, you have to go under mobile development and add a few things. There's a debugger integration package, a remote launch pass package, remote system explorer, um, Remote System Explorer actions. Uh, you add a couple of things and you create an Etsy hosts entry for your Beagle board. And again, remember my warning if you're using DHCP, every time you power cycle it, it's going to change. So if you're using DHCP, you definitely want to do this and know what the new IP address is and change it in Etsy host. You do not want to hard code an IP that changes all the time in Eclipse, all right? So on your Beagle board, you install SSH, which probably was already there, and a GDB server. There's the commands for that. Uh, first time around, you have to manually SSH into the Beagle board so that it generates keys. In Eclipse, you create a connection. Uh, you create a GDB init file. This is a key step, so don't forget that one. Or you're like, why does it work? Um, create a debug configuration. Uh, so how do you create a connection? You go to Remote System Explorer, you go to Connections, New, Linux, and you type in a few things. You can optionally enter IP, user, password, and all that stuff. So you don't have to type in it over and over again. Again, don't forget to create that GDB init file. So you can just use touch and go forth and have fun, finally. You've gotten through all that. Uh, so there's a little bit of setup. It's not really complicated. There's just a, a few steps. Once you get through it, all you have to do is use it, right? You can go and you can take stuff. You can cross compile. It's really cool, especially the first time you're like, oh, that's kind of neat. You know, I built it on this big, powerful machine and I've sent it over here and I didn't have to do anything. Um, a little bit more detail, here's how you, you can go create that debug configuration. As I said, you'll, you can get the slides. Um, make sure you do things though, like uh, have an execute before a, a chmod 777, otherwise things, things tend to get a little flaky and not work right, right? Okay, switching gears a little bit. Building accessories, building your own hardware. This is one example of a power supply, right? I give you the SD card for scale, right? Pretty small. What is this? It's a couple of components, and it's got two 9-volt battery clips. Why does it have two 9-volt battery clips? Well, you can run two 9-volts at once, if you like, or you can run one 9-volt 
and then when it starts to get a little weak, you plug in the other one and unplug the bad one, right? Why would you want to do it that way? Because you don't want to reboot your stuff, right? So you want your stuff to keep on running. Uh, there is some other examples of stuff that you can build, but you know, there's, there's a good place to start. As I said, you're talking about a less than 10 watt device. Right, so you can run it off of a battery for a while. You know, you can run it off of a nine volt for a bit. Um, if you want a little bit more time, you can get something like a little lantern battery or some D cells, and that'll run longer. It's just a little bit bulkier. So it depends on, you know, do you want longevity or do you want size? Do you want the small package that you can plant somewhere pretty easily? All right, so this is what I consider portable. Uh, here's an example of this system up and running. Uh, in this case, I've got an LCD screen. Let's see if I can successfully log in here. So I have a 7-inch LCD touch screen that I've just attached to a Buzz Lightyear lunchbox. It's not even the big size lunchbox. It's the medium size kids lunchbox. And in it, uh, there's enough space that I can throw things like this little keyboard. I love these little keyboard mouse combinations. Uh, you can get these for about 25 bucks off of Amazon. It's got a keyboard, it's got a touch pad, and it's even got, woo, it's got a little laser pointer. All right? So, um, and you can charge it off of a USB port. Hey, I got four. I can even charge it off my device, right? The device, um, I've just named it The Deck. Some of you who are familiar with the book Neuromancer may know what the reference is. Um, so uh, this is The Deck. So you can uh, install a touch screen. I, I actually have the touchscreen disabled because I find the touchscreen obnoxious. And I'd rather use this. Um, you could put a full-size keyboard, but you know, a full-size keyboard doesn't fit my lunchbox. Um, or, if you prefer, you can have a beagle board and find a TV or whatever and work with that. This platform, the deck, also will run on the beagle bone which is a smaller, slightly less powerful platform. All right. uh, BeagleBoard is about $149. These are about $89. They're less if you buy more. But, uh, and of course, the Beagle Bone is even lower powered, and that's good. So you can run it for much, much longer time off of a battery. So it all fits in my lunch box. And here, you're looking at two complete systems, right? So I've got the one with the touch screen in my main lunch box, and then I have my little Spider-Man lunch box for the separate system. You might say, well, but Phil, you only have one display. No problem, because, wait, just wait, there's more. Here's my little network hub, which, guess what powers this? USB. It's all USB. So USB-powered network hub, USB hubs if you want them. Uh, I even have a power cable that uses USB, so I can daisy chain these together. Right? So I can run my second BeagleBoard, BeagleBone, off of the main one. I can network all this stuff together. And then what can I do with that? Well, for example, I could take my Beagle Bone, that's the smallest platform, and again, it's running the full distro, right? It's not quite as powerful. It's the 720 megahertz system versus a gigahertz system. It has half the RAM, but it's still got more than enough to sit and monitor your network and run air crack. Right? So it's not just going to capture packets, it's going to crack your Wi-Fi while it's there. Right? So I can you know, take my little, little bitty power supply here, 
plug it in my BeagleBone, connect it to my little hub, shell into it, program it, disconnect it from my hub, go plant it somewhere, come back in a couple days. All right? It's like, hey, look, I just cracked five Wi-Fi network passwords. Right? So uh, for my first demo, this is the hardware I used. Uh, I thought I brought my Yagi antenna Wi-Fi Canon with me. I'm really hoping I left it at my desk at home because I couldn't find it this morning. So either that or someone has stolen a very nice Wi-Fi antenna. All right. So I have this 15 dB directional Wi-Fi antenna. It has a range of up to three miles. Uh, the building I'm at at the university sucks for Wi-Fi. It's like a big black hole, just sucks in Wi-Fi signals. Uh, so I have an access point downstairs that I have a hard time connecting to, but not with this. Uh, and there is a Hardy's restaurant about a quarter mile away. I can connect to their Wi-Fi just fine. I sit in my office, I'm like, hmm, I want to get, get on the internet. And of course the university does obnoxious things like they filter dangerous websites like, oh, that's an evil hacking website. WebSense has blocked it, and everyone knows it. Well, I shouldn't say this too loud, because they're out there, aren't they? Um, they're 100% they're effective. I have no ways of getting around WebSense. Right. <laughs> well, it's 100% effective for 90% of our students, right? All right, so um, to that, I have a little alpha wireless card. This is one. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these. It's a one watt alpha. Here's a little tip. Here's the two watt alpha, most powerful Wi-Fi device you can buy in this country, blah, blah, blah. Do not buy this. This is a piece of crap, all right? And here's why I'll say that. This overheats, and if you do connect to a network, watch your connection speeds. They go like this, woo, woo, woo. You know, they're up and down, up and down, all right? I would recommend don't buy, don't buy the green one. You know, you're like, ooh, it's fancy, it's green. You know, uh, don't buy it, right? The, the one watt alpha cards are awesome. You, know, um, you can buy the 9 dB antenna though. 9 dB antenna is nice. It works with all of them. Um, so here's my setup. I had a little music. Some of you might recognize that as a DEF CON 20 CD, you know. So, you know, what's the very basic thing? I, I used my system with the LCD display. By the way, you can connect a monitor to your system even if you have the LCD display connected. The only caveat is you might occasionally notice some funny tints on your monitor because of syncing issues and you know having the power to drive both displays at once. But I mean, it works fine. You just might notice a little funniness. All right. Okay. So this is what I call a warm-up demo. So what is the world's most widely used vulnerability at every security conference? MS 08067. So it's like, all right, well, let's see if any of this stuff works. So what did I do? Uh, in the left side, I don't know how legible that is. Oh, it's not very legible. I apologize. Um, I just did a simple Nmap scan of my network, and as you see in the highlighted part, sure enough, I see a process running on port 445 on one of the systems. I'm like, ooh, sounds like I might have a chance at MS08067. So on the right-hand side, I've fired up Metasploit. Looks like I got the, is that a bull or a cow? I don't know, it's debatable. Um, I fired up Metasploit, yeah, of course, I ported Metasploit too. Um, and then in this screen, what do you see? You see, uh, well, sort of see, just, just trust me. There's a lot of trust in these, at these conferences, right? Um, that here, what I've done is I've run my exploit, and I've got a interpreter shell, and if you uh, open up a command prompt, you'll see that, in fact, it says, Microsoft Windows XP version 5, blah, 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 right? So there you have it. Okay, all right, Phil. 
I mean, who still has MS-08067 vulnerabilities? Actually, you might be surprised. You know, sometimes you're like, oh. But have you never patched this thing? But some people haven't. It's like the Brits, right? Uh, we fixed the language for them, didn't we? We fixed the English language. We speak English, they speak British, right? And, you know, some people, particularly Brits, might disagree with this, but um, I told them it's their fault because we've got 200 years of patches they didn't subscribe to. So they didn't get all those fixes. But. Uh, this is maybe a little bit more legible. Uh, here I've done a shell, and it comes up and tells you it's Windows XP. All right, not surprising. All right, what about some little Wi-Fi cracking? So what are you going to do if you want to crack Wi-Fi? Well, probably going to have to start up Airmon NG. So start up Airmon NG uh, using my one watt Wi-Fi adapter, not the two water. Don't buy it. All right. Uh, you know, funny story. I had the two water. I ordered it online. It was coming to my house. I was at DEF CON this summer. I was talking to a vendor, and he's like, I'm like, do you sell those two waters? He goes, oh, we don't sell those. Yeah, we started selling them, and they're just, they're just crap, you know, and they overheat, and they do all this stuff, and I thought, he's trying to sell me another adapter, isn't he? Um, so I'm like, yeah, well, maybe he's right. And it never hurts to have another Wi-Fi adapter, so I, I bought a one-watt adapter from him and that nice Cantena. Um, and then I got home, and I'm like, hey, look, you know, because it hadn't come. Came, came while I was at DEF CON, come home, and then like, oh, he was right. This thing is a total piece of trash. All right, so you fire up Airmon, what do you do? Okay, AeroDump, and you're like, yeah, I see a couple interesting looking networks out there. Um, I can see there's a lot of Apple users. How can I tell there's a lot of Apple users? Look, look at the uh, massive previously connected network lists on some of these. You know, they're going all the way off the screen. And why would I say that? Because a lot of the Mac people, you can't clear it in ver different versions of iOS, right? You have to be connected to a network to forget the network. How convenient is that? That's convenient for us, I guess. All right, so like, yeah, this network looks convenient. It looks like something I might want to crack fire up air crack, and I forget exactly how long it took to find this password. Oh, by the way, any of the uh, networks on here, I did change these passwords, and so don't think you can go back. You know, I know all of you want to do a road trip to Dubuque, and you think you're going to crack all my Wi-Fi networks uh, on campus. No, it's probably not going to happen, but uh, this wise person thought like everyone else and chose password one as their password. And sure enough, it was cracked. Uh, this is a WPA2 password, right, of password one. I have a little sticker on my door at the university I got from uh, Elkhamsoft, and it says, you know, wise men think alike and choose password one. All right, what about a little password cracking? Eh. All right, yeah, it's cool to get on your network, but I want to control your network. I want to control your router. So what do I want to do? I want to crack your router password. So I'm going to crack your router admin password. I'm going to use my password list. I find that the usually my first crack at something, I like the John password list. It's short, and you get a lot of passwords. Sometimes you don't get them all, but you get enough that it's worth trying. The other thing is some of the password lists are not prioritized, right? You get something like that dark code list. It's huge, and it's not prioritized by frequency. So I kind of like the John list and advertisement for John. Um, but so I ran it up, and I had a pretty common password of password, so it took like a second. Right? It buzzed through five of these passwords, and there you have it. Uh, I don't know how many of you like Hydra. Maybe some of you prefer X-Hydra. I also ported that, so it's also available. It just personally, I, 
I, I'm a command line kind of guy. I like to do stuff on the command line. It's, I think it's a little easier. So yeah, I could have used X Hydra, but I didn't. Okay, what about WPS? A little WPS cracking, right? Um, so what tool are you gonna use for that? Reaver, right? So uh, it's in there, right? So it's like, all right, well, let's fire up Reaver. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Reaver uses a problem with the protocol for WPS, and it hacks the pin code. And the pin, I mean, you can have the world's best password that's not in any dictionary, but guess what? That pin code is in a dictionary because there's only so many choices. So, and the, the protocol is flawed, so it tells you, hey, that first half is right. Oh, no, no it's not, sorry, I lied. You know, so it's, uh, it's very convenient because you only have to crack half of it at a time. Uh, so, yeah, here's a, just a little screenshot running Reaver. And you can see it's scanning and going through different things. By the way, just a little tip on using Reaver. Uh, think of what router you're going after. If you go to some of the newer, higher end uh, home uh, office routers like the uh, Cisco Linksys E20, uh, E4200, E4500 kind of routers, and they, they kind of updated their firmware. So if you're just banging on that router with all these WPS requests, guess what? It starts throttling you back and then going, ah, somebody's attacking me. And then it's going to take a long, long time. So um, you might want to pr try to prevent that by throttling yourself back, because if you throttle yourself back, you'll probably still be faster than if you let the people that at Cisco that wrote that firmware throttle you. Right. Uh, so just a little tip. Um, if you are attacking a crappy router, or right, I shouldn't say crappy, an inexpensive router that you might buy for 30, 40 bucks at Best Buy, uh, you know the ones I'm talking about. They have the default uh, SSID of D-Link or Linksys, whatever. Probably have default password too, so I'd try that first. Uh, but if you're trying to hit those guys, uh, you might want to throttle it back because they tend to crash if you hammer them too much. So I usually go with, uh, yeah, it does take longer to crack it, but um, you know, maybe three attempts and delay for a few minutes and then hit it again. And, you know, they, they seem to do okay with that. All right, so here I've got a couple of attempts going. I'm sending this stuff and uh, sure enough my WPS pin for this router was uh, was 5032 and then once you have the pin it said hey password is password one so you probably could have hacked that directly um, and here's the SSID okay. all right this is what I call Ponin Windows 7 like it's a Mac all right, why would I call it that? Well, you know, you might think, uh, Phil, you gotta get your terminology right. That's like poning it like a boss, not like a Mac. Okay, why do I say that? Early this year, like January or so, uh, there was a big thing that came out in the news. And what was this big thing? 600,000 Macs compromised because of a Java problem, right? And what did, some of us do, oh, uh, you know, all you pompous Mac users, look at you. Is that, it's probably not an appropriate response, right? Um, I know that some of us, you know, if you do that internally, maybe that's okay, but let's not delight in the downfall of others, right? Uh, so, yeah, there was this uh, problem, you guys, I'm sure you guys all know about this, with the Java virtual machine, and it took a little time. Uh, and even to this day, you know, I, t I teach security and programming, but I also teach introductory computer classes at the university. Recently, I had this assignment for my intro students that uh, they had to 
tell me about their ideal computer, and a whole bunch of them, I'm gonna buy a Mac because a Mac doesn't get viruses. Um, you know, I was at my daughter's school installing antivirus last week, and the principal is like, well, I have a Mac, so I don't need antivirus. Yeah, exactly, that is bullshit. So, um, but anyway, I thought, well, okay, so you get those, now those Windows users go on, see, see, look, it's you too. Well, guess what? Was Windows also vulnerable to this exact same problem? Yes, it was. So, that's what I mean by poning Windows 7 like it's a Mac. So here I fire up Metasploit, and I pull up this uh, Java atomic reference array uh, exploit. That's what it's called. Set up my options, and set my payload. Let's see, which one did I use? Uh, I just used a simple reverse shell. And hit the ex exploit, browsed on over from a Windows 7 machine that I conveniently borrowed from the university. Um, so as soon as they hit it, sending the jar, sending the jar, bam, I got a shell. You know, it's, and it, shell's been created, hit sessions, I, and there you go, and you see it says Microsoft Windows version 6. It's like, I thought it was Windows 7. I don't know why it's version 6, but whatever. Um, and, you know, you see it's like dumping me to users, University of Dubuque, uh, desktop. It's like, okay. So, yes, I did get them to finally upgrade their job. So, again, for the, my students, don't think you're going to be still be able to do this. All right, last demo. This is what I call a click kitty demo. All right, so click kitty. Click kitty is a term that I and Aaron, Phoenix, Finnan, developed. Uh, and it's kind of like this. Everyone knows what a script kitty is, right? What's a script kitty? Someone that can download stuff off the internet and use it. They can download scripts. All right, so you know you got script kitties and you got actually skilled and you know different levels above that, all the way up to you know some sort of elite hacker status, and then you know below the clip, script kitty you've got like Microsoft users and you know Windows people stuff like that. So um, we came up with a new term to describe someone that's still above those Microsoft people called the click kitty. Well, what's a click kitty? A click kitty is someone that, oh man, I can't, I can't like download that stuff off the internet and type. I can only click. I can only use GUI ponage tools, right? So here's an example. This tool that I have on the screen is called uh, Fern Wi-Fi Cracker. How many of you have heard of this tool before? All right, yeah, this tool debuted about a month ago, DEF CON 20, all right? Uh, so this is like point and click ponage for Wi-Fi. I mean, truly, you don't have to know anything. Okay, one thing. What is my wireless interface? But guess what? You even have you even get to pick that off of a drop-down box. So how does this how does this tool work? All right. Whoops. Um, you click it on the dialog box, and then you say, all right, use this interface, scan. It scans. It's like, hey, I found some of these networks. This one, attack. Go get lunch. You come back, boom. You can't see it so well because it's in red on the screen, but it's probably displaying a network password for a little network I set up around the office. Okay, some of you might be thinking, what the, I thought you said there, there was gonna be some forensics in this talk, you know, and if you've heard me talk for the last couple of years, I've talked a lot about forensics. So uh, I, I don't wanna piss off Jackie Chan, so I better tell you a little bit about forensics. All right, how, how this whole thing got started, I, um, 
have been talking a little bit about USB forensics recently, and I've been using these little microcontroller devices, and they're awesome, but they don't do high-speed USB. So I started thinking, what could I do to go make this move up to high-speed USB? So, you know, the BeagleBoard was out, and shortly after I started working on this stuff, the BeagleBone came out, and I thought, yeah, I should use something like this. Yeah, it's a little more money and a little microcontroller, but I can do high-speed USB. Now, if you know anything about USB, if you're dealing with things like flash drives, the write speed absolutely sucks on those, so full-speed USB is fine. But if you want to do some forensic investigation on a terabyte external hard drive, things are not so fine. I mean, it would take you a long, long time to make a forensic copy of that. So, you know, my, being a programmer and someone that likes to hack code, my initial thought was, I'm just gonna go in there and I'm gonna get those USB Linux drivers and I'm gonna hack the crap out of them and I'm gonna make it do what I want. And then I'm like, oh wait, unfortunately, there's an easier way and a better way. So I'm like, there goes that fun hacking project. So what's the easier way? UDEV rules. How many of you are familiar with UDEV rules? All right. UDEV rules are a beautiful thing. It, they control what happens when you connect and disconnect stuff. So what I did is I created what I call a magic hub. So everything that's connected downstream of the magic hub is automatically mounted and mounted read-only. So you don't have to worry about altering it. All right? If you want to have your magic hub and paint it green because it's you know you're good to go and you don't have to worry about it you want to put sparkles on it go ahead I don't care all right but the cool thing about this is that you can use it for anything that you can mount by USB which is essentially anything because you always can get an adapter um, here is just to give you a little bit of what do the rules look like you have a series of matching conditions uh, so here it says action is add, all right, I've added a block device, and it's one of these devices, and if there is an parent vendor ID of 1A40 and a parent product ID of 0101, which happens to be the vid and PID for a particular hub that I used, uh, then I set an environment variable, and I set a couple of things. Uh, and then I have another action for removing things. Right? Uh, these actions create scripts. So they, have, they run scripts that create other scripts, which might sound kind of dumb at first, but if you look at how this stuff works and when things run, you end up having to do this. Right? So it, it, in the end, there's two scripts that write two other scripts. There's a, a, an add script and a remove script. And this just shows you what those scripts look like, uh, you know, I'm mounting stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so as I said, this script, all it does is it creates another script. So that's why there's a bunch of echo commands. Um, another similar script. Uh, that product, by the way, I call, you know, this product is called the deck. That's the four deck, the forensic deck. I am uh, in future directions trying to add other packages to the deck platform, uh, also looking at other accessories, output devices. Um, I had a vendor that contacted me a little while ago when he heard I was doing this, and he said, hey, can I sell like preloaded SD cards and maybe even preloaded systems? And I said, sure, whatever, it's open source, do whatever you want. Um, so that is available now. I'll show you the URL for that uh, in a little bit. Uh, you can download the stuff and download my install script. The only warning is the install script is about three gig because it has an archive for the root file system. The root file system on the deck is about six gigabytes worth of stuff. So there's a lot of goodies in there. Uh, it takes about an hour and a half to 
copy six gigabytes to a class four SD card. Now, if you get one of the more expensive, fast ones, uh, you can do it quicker. Uh, if you want, I actually do have a couple of extra preloaded cards. I might be able to sell you for like 10 bucks or whatever um, if you don't want to spend the time. Um, so other stuff I'm looking at possibly associating with a standard pen test distro of some sort, uh, maybe a port to another platform soon, and uh, some full-on weaponization of the platform. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm also in aviation. Uh, there might be an aviation aspect. I won't go into all the details about what I have in mind, but uh, you might see more of this taking flight soon. So, um, and this is what the, these cases look like. Uh, they're just little acrylic cases. They're kind of nice. Um, funny story, this vendor is like, okay, I'll send you some cases. He overnighted them to my house. They arrived yesterday. So, but here's a picture. I, they, the, it looks nice in the picture, but that's a demo, right? So who knows what they really look like. Um, anyway, if you have any questions, uh, here's the link to where you can buy the preloaded stuff if you want. I mean, or you can just download stuff and do it yourself. That's fine. It's open source. Let's all share. Uh, so there's the link for that. Uh, if you want, if you have any questions we don't answer right now, you can see me after. You can email me at that email address. Uh, you can go look at my blog. And as I said, I do have a couple of preloaded SD cards that I'd be willing to sell you for cheap. So any questions? <laughs>